ME 109G, the Gustav, captured after the Battle of El Alamein in 1942, stored for many years, nearing end of 16 year rebuild to be the only airworthy original wartime 109 of 33,000 built. Paul Day, Spitfire pilot and Spitfire critic, climbs into a Messerschmitt for the first time. Well, good grief. The overall impression is actually most discouraging. The canopy, the whole design of the canopy seems to be based on a Kaiser's helmet or an afterthought or I really don't know what. The second immediate impression is just how unbelievably small it is. It is probably a good 25% less working room even than a Spitfire, which surprises me. Given, given that I'm lightly built and didn't have that much room in a Spitfire, there is actually no room whatsoever and in fact I could do with a lot more room at shoulder height here. There is quite considerable interference with the ability to move the stick left and right. It affects your ability to swivel round even without the canopy shut. Right, well, let's see what it's like with the lid down. Well, well, this certainly isn't for the squeamishly claustrophobic. Even with no helmet and with a relatively low seat cushion, head is already against the top of the canopy, so-called canopy. Fairly obviously, the first thing that takes you is just how little room. It is probably, it's a good 100% worse than the problem of turning around to look behind you in a Spitfire. The view forward, well, is almost all either Krupps of Essen or two inches of armoured glass. It's impossible to fly this aeroplane with a canopy open, which accounts for the provision of the sliding side windows, which is fine. However, as it has no side door either, then the consequences of crash landing coming to rest upside down are fatal, undoubtedly. Okay, let's do a bit more weightlifting on what is actually a very heavy canopy, which I wouldn't care to have drop on my head or wrestle with in a bailout situation, and take a look at what, to be fair to the aeroplane, are some features in the cockpit which I actually like. Starting on the left, the elevator trim wheel is perhaps a bit too big, but uh, nicely positioned and business-like. Throttle quadrant is nice, throttle friction is nice, it's all business-like, well to hand, and of course that allows sufficient space for what is perhaps the best comparative feature, cockpit-wise, between the 109 and the Spit, in that the undercarriage controls are nicely to hand just in front of the throttle controls and do not require that one changes hands immediately after takeoff. Blind flying panel, given that it's not particularly familiar to me, looks okay and I particularly like the artificial horizon. One can cage it and thereby uh, keep it from damage toppling during heavy manoeuvre or possibly even fast directed afterwards. It's a much more business-like instrument than Spitfires. There is then, of course, the breach of the cannon which fires through the spinner, which seems to take up quite inordinate amounts of room. The engine gauges and fuel gauge quite reasonably easy to read. But other than that, it's... I must return to my previous verdict on it. It is unbelievably small, unbelievably cramped, and I certainly wouldn't care to go to war in it given the knowledge that the, the, the opposition was equipped with a Spitfire. I think it's terrible.
The Gustav of 1942 was the most numerous variant of the Messerschmitt 109s built during the war years. It was, as has been said, produced in a third of the man-hours a Spitfire 5 required. Yet it was more technically advanced. For example, its Daimler-Benz engine was fuel-injected, and the airframe seems well-engineered. Tony Bianchi. Yeah, I must say it's quite an eye-opener to me. I've always been led to believe that the 109 wasn't very well made and uh, there were all sorts of complications on it, but on first appraisal, it's, uh, it's certainly superb. Fuselage, for instance, is it's got very nicely let in uh, skins onto a frame and they're, they're let in very carefully and it's nicely flush riveted. It's a second generation monocoque aircraft and it's certainly more modern in areas. Um, the, the skinning on the Spitfire is, is rather old fashioned in various areas and uh, it's quite complex as well. This is a lot more simple. There's no double curve skins at all on the fuselage anywhere. It's all really quite easily done in the field for repair and I'm sure in manufacture it was very simple and easy. I was always under the impression they were hurried in some areas. Okay, there's some skins which uh, haven't been particularly nicely put on, but it's, it doesn't detract away from its general quality. There's some beautiful engineering in it and uh, some excellent uh, quality workmanship as well. All the sort of general servicing, such as removing sparking plugs, is very much uh, easier than, for instance, with a Merlin. Getting the lead ends on is difficult, but with this, it's very easily accessible. The cowlings are very easy to undo. They're, you don't have the same problem as with a spit, for instance. Lots of cowling fasteners that, that you usually shake into pieces and worn out. With this, it's three fasteners and you undo the cowling. Um, you can get at the oil cooler easily. Wonderfully accessible. The Spitfire in its own way is its a completely different sort of aircraft. This, I think you'd have to be attuned to it and be used to continental aeroplanes to feel the benefit. I must say the Merlin looks old fashioned. This engine certainly looks like looking at a German Grand Prix car of the uh, pre-war period and it's at the moment it's beautifully clean and uh, it's very much a, an engineering job, probably over-engineered for its uh, needs at the time. However, the ME-109s were not easy aircraft to fly. Indeed, one Luftwaffe test pilot described the landing characteristics of the Gustav as malicious. Over 1,500 student pilots were killed in flying accidents in 109s in the first two years of the war. No wonder congratulations were in order following a successful student's landing. But why were the ME-109 so difficult? Boscombe Down test pilot Reg Hallam. Uh, part of the problem is the geometry of this undercarriage. You can see how the, the legs are splayed out like that. And if you do get the airplane going sideways on takeoff and landing, the leg wants to dig in and uh, cause the swing to increase. And also, there's two or three degrees of towing on the wheels. And if you do get up on one wheel, the airplane wants to sort of bicycle around like that. So it's very important to keep the nose of the airplane pointing in the right direction on takeoff and landing. And to be able to do that, of course, you've got to see. see you need to be able to see out uh, to the front well. And that's just what you don't have in this airplane. So you've got to work particularly hard in looking left and right on takeoff and landing to keep your directional control. An interesting feature is this leading edge slat. You should be able to push it in with one finger. They operate automatically when you're pulling the aeroplane hard in manoeuvre or sl flying it slowly. And what happens is they pop out like that and then high energy air goes through this slot and over the upper surface of the wing and you get extra lift that way. Um, they're very gentle and benign in operation. They work very smoothly, and even if they operate asymmetrically, one before the other, you don't get any of those nasty snatch rolls that you can get on some airplanes that have this design feature. They're, they're very, very smooth handling uh, devices. Malta, 1942. The island is under siege, and the only defenders a few war-weary hurricanes, which are totally outclassed. Spitfire fives were flown from carriers, and Malta became a repeat of the Battle of Britain. This 